did we didn't we didn't do much. All right, let's get going. And this is the second time as an adult that I can remember losing my voice. We'll blame it on Missouri. <clears throat> I did take Clarendon this morning. It's better now than it was when I got up. So <clears throat> I apologize. I hope that by tomorrow night, my voice is back so you guys can know what I sound like. <laughs> and here's what we'll do. We'll start and we'll do as long as I can. And if you guys get to the point where I can't listen to this anymore, then we'll stop and I'll figure out a game plan to get as much done tomorrow as we can. What we're going to do is we're going to pick up with Proposition 4 there on page 4. I asked my wife to read the propositions just to minimize the talking that I can do. Let me open with prayer and then we'll get started. Father in heaven, we do thank you again for this day. Locals have talked about they have, they've needed rain, so we thank you for the rain that refreshes, refreshes the earth. And Father, as we go through this study tonight, I pray that you'll help me and my voice to have the strength it needs. That my, my, our minds will have the attentiveness we need. We can learn some things from your scriptures, and especially that we can just continue to understand the principles by which we can be the best church that you would have us to be. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Fire when ready, dear. You have to turn it on. Move it. Get the sound people. <laughs> Is it really? No, there we go. All right. And just so you guys know, I told John he cannot complain about the temperature in here. <laughs> like he did last night, he said, I'm hot. I'm like, no, I'm comfortable. And then I was freezing. So anyway, <laughs> I saw some... I saw some people brought coats and stuff like that, so I said, John, just don't wear your coat, you'll be fine. All right. All right, proposition number four states that although the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are inseparably connected, making together but one perfect and entire revelation of the divine will for the edification and salvation of the church, and therefore in that respect cannot be separated, Yet as to what directly and properly belongs to their immediate object, the New Testament is as perfect a constitution for the worship, discipline, and government of the New Testament church, and as perfect a rule for the particular duties of its members as the Old Testament was for the worship, discipline, and government of the Old Testament church and the particular duties of its members. Thank you very much. So what he's saying is there is a distinction between the Old Testament and the New. But there's a connection that needs to be understood. And the New Testament is what Thomas Campbell says. The New Testament is a perfect constitution for the worship, discipline, and government. It has a unique authority for the New Testament church. <clears throat> now, if you notice beside worship there, the things I put down are Sabbath, tithe, festivals, and you're thinking, well, aren't those Old Testament things? Well, yeah, they are. None of those are carried over to the new. In the Old Testament had some formal rituals that had to be followed. The Sabbath was commanded by God. The tithe was commanded by God. The festivals were commanded by God. When you come to the New Testament, you don't find any of those things. Now, there are verses like, don't forsake the assembling ourselves together, but there's nothing in the New Testament that says Sunday is the holy day. There's nothing in the New Testament that says you have to give 10% of this. There's nothing in the New Testament that says you have to, that all the males have to come to the church for a week during Easter and Christmas and pick another holiday. There's none of that in the New Testament. Under discipline, there is, in the New Testament teaches right versus wrong. It teaches holy versus unholy. It teaches those things. It also teaches what the government is supposed to be. It teaches about evangelists and elders. And deacons are a little more, you know, it's not quite as clear. But the New Testament becomes the 
what he called the perfect constitution for what we should do and look like and be organized. That the New Testament teaches it now what the Old Testament did for them. Now, I gave you a bunch of passages in there, and I debated about looking at them or not looking at them, and I decided just for the sake of my voice, we wouldn't look at them. But all those passages in Acts, what you'll see is New Testament preachers using Old Testament scriptures to show that Jesus is the Christ or, or and that the church is the fulfillment of the promises to David. That's how they use the Old Testament if that makes sense. Now, Romans 15.4, Paul writes, in Romans 15.4, Paul writes that whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. When he says things written before, he's talking about the Old Testament. The Old Testament scriptures were written for our learning. There, there's a lot of things to learn back there. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11 is the same exact thing. Paul writes there, he says, I don't want you to be, I, want, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, they all passed through the sea, they're all baptized into Christ in the cloud, in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food. But we get down in verse 6, he says, these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, don't become idolaters, don't commit sexual morality. Don't tempt Christ. And all those are all fun. And then he had to include verse 10, nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyers. And verse 11 says, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written, upon, uh, they were written for our admonition. And there's two places in there where Paul says, <clears throat> those things in the Old Testament, they're written down for our examples that we can go back and look and see what they did, what they were supposed to do, why it was right or wrong, and how do we apply that to our life. And every one of these are easy to, all of these that he came in here are all easy to apply. But the Old Testament doesn't have the rules and regulations. It doesn't have the standards of which we, we try to figure out how to organize the New Testament church we don't go to the Old Testament and say, 2 Kings, whatever says this. The New Testament is us. But we don't ignore the Old Testament because it has things to offer. And that's the point that he's making. And I won't cover the rest of those. Any questions on that proposition? Is that the rain? What's that now? <laughs> yeah. All right, that was Proposition 4. Proposition 5. That with respect to the commands and ordinances of our Lord Jesus Christ, where the scriptures are silent as to the express time or manner of performance, if any such there be, no human authority has power to interfere in order to supply the supposed deficiency by making laws for the church, nor can anything more be required of Christians in such cases, but only that they observe these commands and ordinances as will be evidently, is that right? As will, oh, as will evidently answer the declared and obvious end of their institution. Much less has any human authority power to impose new commands or ordinances upon the church which our Lord Jesus Christ has not enjoined. Nothing ought to be received into the faith or worship of the church or be made a term of communion among Christians that is not as old as the New Testament. Thank you very much. So what he's saying is there's a place where the New Testament is spoken and there's issues where it is not talked about. And the statement that we that I, Thomas Campbell said that we talked about last night, where the scriptures speak, we speak, and when the scriptures are silent, we silent. We are silent. The first half of that's easy to apply. <clears throat> when he says, you know, the person that believes is baptized will be saved, that's easy to apply. When they came together on the first day of the week to observe the Lord's Supper, that's easy to apply. When he says, husbands, love your wives, that's easy to apply. 
But there's, it's a lot more difficult to apply the second half where the scriptures are silent. We are silent. And what I put on there is silence works both ways. And what I mean by that is, you know, unless there's a clear New Testament teaching, we can't insist that people do certain things. But we also can't insist that they not do certain things. And one of the best examples of that is the whole idea of musical instruments and the non-instrumental guys. The New Testament doesn't say use an instrument. But the New Testament doesn't say don't use an instrument. The New Testament doesn't say anything. And it's wrong to come along and say you can't do that. But the New Testament doesn't say anything about that. And either way is speaking where the Bible's silent. To tell somebody that they cannot do certain things is not correct. And to tell people that they, that they um, not do certain things, I think I just said that, didn't I? To tell somebody they not do certain things isn't right, you, you just can't do that. What you can do is insist that they do the things that the New Testament says do. I hope I said that in a meaningful way. I'm still running that through my mind. <clears throat> Where the scripture's silent, nobody has the authority to come along and, and fill it in. I love the way he said that up there. In order, that no human authority has the power to interfere in order to supply the supposed deficiency. It's like, God forgot to tell us this. I'll figure it. I'll fill it in. I think that's kind of funny. All that's required of us is to observe the commands and ordinances we find in the New Testament. Baptism, Lord's Supper, and then other things where thou shalt. Now, the scriptures here, one of the things we talked about last night is the authority of scriptures. The authority of the scriptures. Now, the, the first couple of verses there, John 14, John 16, we won't read those, but that is where Jesus promised the apostles that they would be led into all truth. He promised the apostles that he would bring to their remembrance the things they were taught. It was to the apostles he said, I got other things to say to you, you can't bear with them now. But when the Spirit comes, he will teach those things to you. It was to the apostles that they were promised that the truth would be delivered. And I should have put these in a different order, but I've, I've actually got them in the order they occur in the Bible. Ephesians 2 is where Paul writes, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And you can see the stacking order. Jesus promised the apostles they'd be led in all truth. Then he tells us the church is built on what was delivered to them. That's what we do. We do the things that they tell us to do. And we don't do the things that they don't tell us to do. And if they don't talk about something, we leave it out. You guys have a drum set. Who played the drums the other day? Boy, that was great, by the way. I only say that because I don't know what it is about drums. Sometimes you go to church building, that's all you can hear. Yeah. And there's nowhere in the New Testament that says you have to have a drum set. And there's nowhere in the New Testament that says you can't have a drum set. But I've been in churches, you think the Bible said that. <laughs> and... I love music, by the way, and uh, I like all musical instruments. That's what we go on the record as that. I played trombone growing up, made all state band twice. I played in the Clemson marching band, Tiger Band. So I played in the Clemson marching band back in the day. This has nothing to do with the study, but it does have to do with drums. In the trombone section, we had a thing at home games. At home games, we didn't go to the stands. We marched around the stadium, marched into the field, did the pregame show, and then, what we can, then went up into the stands. Well, whatever you brought to the stands had to go with you on the field because that was the only way to get it in there. And we had this contest among the trombone section for hats you could wear to the game. And we had this trombone player named Bo. And we get up in the stands and we look over there, and Bo's got this big old sombrero on. And we're thinking, how in the world did you get that big old sombrero in? He had conned one of the bass drum players 
to take the bass drum head out. He'd throw it inside the bass drum, put the bass drum back. Now, I thought that was cheating, you know, because my ball cap and stuff I'd wear, I stuffed in my uniform, so. I don't know why I said that. Now, the next verses, I, Paul knew what he was doing. Paul knew what he was doing. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, I mentioned this last night. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, Paul corrects their abuse of spiritual gifts. And after spending three chapters fixing that, he gets down in 1 Corinthians 14, 36, and he mockingly says to them, did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? Sometimes when you read Paul, you got to realize he had a real sarcastic side to it. And every once in a while you read Paul, and you got to remember that, he could, he could jab them. And then in verse 37, he says this, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. If I wrote that today, I'm convinced lightning would strike me. But Paul knew what he was doing. He knew the things he wrote were the commandments of the Lord. And I, I, I talk to people sometimes, and I said, there's a test of spirituality. Acknowledge that the things that the apostles wrote are the commandments of the Lord. And this is all related to the authority of the Scriptures. What we do in this Proposition 5 is we do the things the apostles told us to do. Then, same thing over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. I'm 13. Paul says the same thing over there. He said, For this reason we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as in truth the word of God. I mean, he's acknowledging the things that he wrote to them was the words of God. I just shudder when I think about that. I can only imagine Paul writing that. And then same thing in, in chapter 4, verse 8. He who rejects this doesn't reject man, but God. Timothy was written to tell a young evangelist what he's supposed to do in the church and how the church is supposed to operate. And those things are, I mean, we're, we're not going to read all the first Tim, Timothy, but those are the things we're to do. And the things that are expressly talked about in the New Testament, those commands and ordinances, that's what we do. And if the Bible doesn't talk about it, we can do it or not do it. It's up to us. But nobody can come along and say, you have to do that if it's not written, or you can't do that if it is written. Any questions on that one? And I hope you're, in your mind, I hope you're thinking what I said last night was correct, which is, you know, these are some good principles. These are some good principles. All right, dear, you ready? Number six. That although inferences and deductions from Scripture premises, when fairly inferred, may be truly called the doctrine of God's holy word, yet are they not formally binding upon the consciences of Christians farther than they perceive the connection, and evidently see that they are so. For their faith must not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power and veracity of God. Therefore, no such deductions can be made in terms of communion, but do properly belong to the after and progressive edification of the church. Hence, it is evident that no such deductions or inferential truths ought to have any place in the church's confession. Very good. Now, what here's this is a great thought. And one of the reasons we kind of went through those last two a little quickly, partly because of my voice, but partly because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for this. This is one of the most important ones in here. Now, what Campbell's saying is make, make a distinction between what the scripture says and what you think it means. Logical, logical deductions are human conclusions. And don't confuse those with the scripture themselves. And I'll explain that here in just a second. If Christians today could learn to separate their conclusions based on scriptural statements from the actual teaching, then and never make their conclusions test of fellowship, most of the doctoral controversies we have would disappear. Now, I got that from Dr. James North. I think that's actually a direct quote from his book. Dr. James North taught at Cincinnati Bible Seminary for a long time, 
He wrote a history book called Union and Truth. It's a very good book, by the way, if you're interested in restoration movement history. The, next, the first bullet on top of the page. There, there are areas, there may be areas where the scriptures aren't clear. And in those areas, we can't make, we can't make those areas test of, of fellowship. Don't make the deductions, the things that we figure out from the scriptures, don't make those things binding beyond a person's ability to accept it and understand it. And I'll, under, I'll explain that in just a second. Now, because a person's faith doesn't stand on the wisdom of man. A person's faith stands on the power and truthfulness of God. Not on, your faith is not based on my ability to explain something to you. Your faith is based on your ability to understand the word of God. Now, Romans 12 lists seven gifts. And one of those gifts is the gifts of teaching. And I'm not saying this in a bragging way. That's one of the gifts that I have. One of the gifts in there is grace. That is not me. Now, I'm a gentle spirit, but I drag myself to hospitals because I have to go. But some of you out there, you can't get there fast enough because that's your gift. No, we all have our different gifts. And the, the people who can teach, it, it, the people who have that gift, they're the ones that can study through passages figure out what they teach, and teach them to people. That's a gift that God gives that teachers are supposed to use. After that gift is employed, however, I can't require you as a test of fellowship to accept what I taught you. It doesn't go beyond your ability to understand and comprehend it. Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, we got a whole bunch of examples. Are you ready? So let's, if, if you don't have your Bible, that's fine. If you do have your Bible, that's finer. The first one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. And I'm going to go through these because I think it's fun to go through it, and it'll illustrate perfectly what I'm talking about. So 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, down to verse 26. I don't know why I put those verses in there. <clears throat> that's not what I meant to put in. I meant to go all the way down through verse 29. Actually, verse 30. So if you want to pin an ink, that's fine. Here's what Paul writes, 1 Corinthians verse 11, verse 23. I bet the last time I taught this, I said, I didn't go far enough down there. Here's what Paul writes. He says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, most of you guys could probably recite that. Then in verse 30, 27, he says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. And here's my question to you. In verse 20, I'm sorry, in verse 29, which is a verse I forgot to put down on my list there, what does he mean when he says discerning the Lord's body? Is he talking about the physical body of Jesus hanging on the cross? That while we're taking the Lord's Supper, we need to focus on that? And, or when he says not discerning the Lord's, Supper, Lord's body, is he talking about the church, the body of Christ? Now the answer is the second. Because he's already mentioned the first. He's already said, this do in remembrance of me. And he says in verse 27, if you drink in an unworthy manner, you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Then he shifts gears. But examine yourself. And you examine yourself and eat of the bread. He who eats in an unworthy manner brings judgment on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. But look at the, 
the next verse, verse 39 says, 30 says, for this reason, many are weak and sick and sleep, meaning die. He, he explains verse 29 with verse 30. Why were they sick and why were they weak? Because when they were taking Lord's Supper, part of the examination is how is the congregation doing? Is there somebody that has an issue here? Is there somebody sick there? Somebody had this problem? And I said, that's a need that I need to address. And because they weren't doing that, some were weak and some were sick and some were asleep. Now, am I right on that? I think so. Could I be wrong? Yeah, maybe. But my point is, you maybe you've never heard that before. Maybe you've heard that hundreds of times. I don't know. I cannot make it a test of fellowship of you that you agree with me on that. Because I deduce that by studying the passage. All I know is it says not discerning the Lord's body. Does that make sense? You can agree or disagree with me on that passage. You won't hurt my feelings. All right, the next one is, I'll skip Matthew 13, 33. Matthew 12, verse 22. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. So here's another example of what we're talking about. Matthew 12, verse 22. Then one was brought to him, him there's Jesus. So then one was brought to Jesus, who was demon-possessed, blind and mute. And he healed him. So the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, ah, oh, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. And verse 28 says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter the strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. And then verse 31 says this. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. Well, that's what the Bible says. And I've had a dozen people or more ask me, what, what is that blaspheme of the Holy Spirit? Because I don't want to do that. Well, in the context, it appears what's happening is he healed a blind and mute man. The people saw that, and they kind of came to the conclusion, oh, you know, this guy might be the Christ. That's what they mean when they say, could this be the son of David? And... That seems like a reasonable deduction from watching him in action. But the Pharisees, they said, nope, this guy's in league with the devil. He's casting out demons by the devil. And Jesus talks to him, and verse 30, if I, I'm sorry, 28, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. He's kind of telling them, listen, I'm casting out demons by the Spirit of God. I'm not doing this myself. I'm doing this by God's Spirit. And that is an indication that the kingdom of God, which you guys have been waiting for, it's, it's ready to be here. It's here. And then he says the famous, my Bible says, the unpardonable sin. You know, my Bible says the unpardonable sin. In the context, it seems that what he's saying is, when he says, if you blaspheme against the Spirit, it won't be forgiven. It seems like what he's saying is, if you get to the point where you can see Jesus doing miracles and you'll attribute those to the devil, then you're so hardened you'll never repent. I think that's what he's saying. 
And my point is, I think that's right. But I'm not even, I'm not sure. And I can't make that a test of fellowship with you. Can you commit that sin today? Well, some people would say, yes, you could, you can attribute Jesus' miracles to the devil. You can do that today. Some people say, no, that was only for them. They physically saw Jesus in the flesh. And they physically saw him do those miracles and attribute it to the devil. We can't do that today because we're not going to physically see Jesus. Other people just throw up hands and say, I don't know. And my point is, it's not, that's a hard passage to understand. And we try to study it. We try to learn it. We try to come to conclusions. But whatever our conclusions are, we can't make them test of fellowship. My job as a teacher is to give you some options. Now, we're going through this real fast. I mean, I could probably spend 30 minutes on this. But I'm just kind of illustrating what Thomas Campbell's talking about. The conclusions that I come to that passage, I might understand them pretty strong in my own mind. But I cannot require that of you beyond your ability to understand and accept it. Okay? No, 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 we're not done reading. I'm just looking at you to see if you're okay. All right, the next one is going to be Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And I intentionally picked some hard ones out to illustrate this. So I hope nobody goes home and thinks, that guy's nuts, I'm not coming back tomorrow. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends the 70 out. And they come back. And they come back in verse 17 of Luke chapter 10. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, they say, the 70 return with joy. Your Bible might say 72. It's okay. It's not that, not that big a deal. The 70 return with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and trample on, I'm sorry, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. If it wasn't for verse 18, this would be easy to understand. But in verse 18, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, what is that talking about? It could be a reference back to creation and the original fall of Satan when Satan got kicked out of heaven. Could be a reference to that. It could be a reference to the current time period that this happened. He sent them out and they came back and he says, Lord, I'm sorry, they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in our name. And Jesus, who knew all things, remember, he didn't need anybody to testify about man because he knew it was in man. He says to them, to John Mitchell paraphrase, yeah, I know, I was watching. I was seeing that when you guys were casting out demons. In other words, I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw that. Or it could be a reference to the future when you get to the end, when Satan's heading for the hell prepared for the devil and his angels. There are very good arguments for all three of those. Now, I know which one's right, but I'm not going to tell you. Whichever one of those is right, now, seriously, I hold the middle one, that Jesus is saying, I, I know, I saw, I watched. How sure am I that? I don't know, maybe. But you get the point? When you come in here Sunday morning, I'm not going to open my Bible up and say, what do you think that means? And you say, well, that's talking about when Jesus, when the devil is cast out back in creation. And I'm saying, well, that's it. You're not my brother. You can't make your deductions of scriptures a test of fellowship. And if you come to me and you say, John, I was reading my Bible and I read that and I don't know what that's talking about. I'm going to tell you what I just told you. It could be this. I might give a little more explanation. It could be this with a little more deeper explanation. Or it could be that. It might even look over there in Revelation where it talks about being thrown into the lake of fire. 
And I'll tell you, all three of those are pretty good explanations. And one of those is probably right. This is the one I hold. And you're going to go home, you're going to think about it. And I can't, when you come back tomorrow, I can't make that a test of fellowship with you. The Bible says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And until you're convinced in your own mind what God's talking about, we'll let it go. Okay? I love this principle. Because I, I, if we could just learn to do this, if we could just learn to do this. And the last one, there's a whole bunch of them on there. Um, well, actually, we'll do two more. The next one is over in Luke chapter 14. We'll do two more, and then it'll be a quarter till, and then we'll be done. We're done with this part. How many did I tell you we were going to do tonight? How many have we done? This is the third one? Okay, good. All right, Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Then verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost? Rather, he has enough to finish it. Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Verse 31. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider the cost? I'm calling it first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now one of the reasons I want to talk about this one is my best friend, and I disagree on this passage. And he's my best friend. Proving that you don't have to make your understandings test of fellowship. One of us thinks, he says, if you, don't, if you don't count the cost, you can't be my disciple. If you're going to begin, if you're going to participate in the kingdom, if you're going to build a tower, if you're going to be part of God's work, then you've got to, I mean, you've got to be committed to it. If you're going to wage the spiritual battles that Satan has before us, you, you've got to be committed to it. If, you're, if you don't forsake all, you can't be my disciple. The other of us thinks this, that Jesus is the tower builder. He's the one building the tower. And Jesus is the king going to war. And Jesus has figured out what kind of disciples he needs to build the kingdom and to wage war. And the kind of disciples he needs is those who forsake all. Now, which one of those understandings is right? Well, probably one of the two could be a third option. But my point is, I don't know. And if you disagree with me on what I understand, I can't make that test of fellowship with you. Somebody smile out there. The last one, where are the dead? Are they still in paradise? Or are they in heaven? My best friend and I disagree on this too. When Jesus ascended to heaven, did he take everybody with him? And everybody is now in heaven? Or are they still in paradise? Now, in paradise, they're in comfort in Abraham's bosom. Or are they still in paradise, awaiting for Jesus to come back in the resurrection? <laughs> Does the Bible tell us? No. No. Not clearly. Do we make that a test of fellowship? No. 
But there's nowhere in the New Testament says that Jesus took the dead saints to heaven. That's the point. If the New Testament said Jesus took the dead saints to heaven, and you came in and said, they're still in paradise, I would say, I don't know about that. And, but the point is, but that's what happens. People come along, and they've decided the dead are in heaven. And that's a test of fellowship. And that's not right. We shouldn't make anything a test of fellowship beyond our ability to understand it as it's taught. Now, I could spend, I think I've got a, I did a, we used to do this thing at the Union Grove Christian Church where we would do on the fifth Sunday, so you know, it's four of those a year. On the night of the fifth Sunday, I did this thing called cross training. I thought that was kind of a creative title. And we would do an hour and a half study on some topic. We'd do a deeper study on some topic. I did an hour and a half study on this topic. Where are the dead? I mean, it takes that long to really do it exhaustive. And I won't tell you what conclusion we came up to. But the point is, I could, talk, I could teach on that for an hour and a half. And you could walk out of here and go, I don't think John's right on that. And I would think, okay, that's fine. You know? So, that is Proposition 6. And I think it's one of the most valuable ones because churches, you know, the, the preacher in a congregation is going to be the primary teacher. And I just gave you what, one, two, three, four, five passages in there we talked about where being dogmatic about what it teaches is not possible. But your preacher and your elders, they probably have an understanding of each one of those that's a certain position. And that's what they're going to teach you. And you're probably going to accept that out of respect for them. And they're going to explain it to you. They're not just going to throw it out there and demand that you understand it. They're going to explain it to you. And you're going to go down the street and you're going to meet somebody who's got a preacher on the other side of that. And you can't make those things test of fellowship. That's how the church gets everybody in their own little stovepipe. And we lose the unity we talked about last night. So let's don't make a, anything a test of fellowship, an article of faith, beyond what's plainly, expressly written, and beyond our ability to understand what the Bible teaches. And having been in this position now for five years and been to a lot of congregations, I've learned how, that's why I kind of on a soapbox on this, because I know congregations out there that don't get along and they don't get along based on things like this, which is really sad. Any questions? I should have planted a couple of questions out there. That's okay. Yeah. Oh, you were too? <clears throat> well, yeah. How long were the creation days? They were literal 24-hour days. And my understanding of Genesis 1, just a normal week. A 24-hour day, my 24-hour day, six of those. And then a rest day on the seventh day. And I'm a young earther, that the earth is not very old. And I have arguments on those, but one of the, the premier argument, there's two arguments really in favor of that view. Argument number one is, when God gave the Sabbath, basically God said, you do what I did. I worked for six days, I took a day off. You work for six days and take a day off. And if those days were millions of years, I don't know how to interpret that. And the second argument is, and if I'd known I was going to be asked this, I'd looked it up. In Genesis 1, it says in there, there was evening and morning the first day. Evening and morning the second day. You have the ordinal in front of the word. First day, second day. And I went through the trouble to do this, by the way. If you go through the Old Testament, I can't remember the number of times. My mind wants to tell me it's in the 500s, something like 500 times in the Old Testament, you have a number in front of a day. First day, eighth day, 40th day, third day. I went through the trouble one day with my Accordance Bible software of looking all those up and reading through every one of them. From Genesis 2 forward, Every time that construction occurs, it's just a regular 24-hour day. Well, why is it not in Genesis 1? And that's the other argument. 
But would I make that a test of fellowship? I better not. Because, I mean, some people say, yes, you have to make that test of fellowship. Well, I don't know anywhere in the Bible where it says they were normal 24-hour days. That's what I need. But my job as a teacher is to study those out, try to understand them and teach them. That's growing in the grace and knowledge. But I teach that to you. And you've been a Christian for 16 years. And you've never been taught that. And you're thinking, wow, I've never heard that. My kids go to school. The earth is billions of years old. I mean, they're bomb we're bombarded by that. And now for the first time in 16 years, someone's telling you the earth isn't very old and those were normal days. Well, more than likely, it's going to take a little time for, that, for you to understand that. And you might come back, hey, can you explain that to me again? I can't remember exactly what you said. And while I'm going through the teaching process, you're working on that. And until God's truth and truthfulness comes to you in a clear way, I, I have no right to demand that as a test of fellowship of you. And that's the point. Correct. <laughs> well, they're out there. And if you meet them, you could ask them why. Be curious to what they say. And there are other artists besides the two I gave you, but those are two of the best ones. Oh, I totally agree on that. Yeah. Oh, that's right, because sin brought death. And if you, if you have millions of years, yeah, there's all kinds. I, I, I totally agree. And that is, a, there's a difference between somebody out here deciding if they accept it or not, and you guys saying, okay, you can teach. And one of the things that gets our churches in trouble is letting people teach who haven't been properly vetted. Because I totally agree with you that. Marcus Dodds wrote for the Expositor's Bible, the Genesis section of the Expositor's Bible. And he has a quote that's always stuck with me. And he wrote, talking about Genesis 1, about those verses, about them being a literal 24-hour day. And he said, if those days were not literal 24-hour days, the interpretation of Scripture is hopeless. And I've always, I have kind of agree with that. It's really not hard to understand. But I'm just saying you have to do some study to understand that. That's, that's my opinion. Now you, can, you can disagree with that and say, John, it's plain. I would agree with you that it's plain. Yes? I agree with you completely. But what I, all I'm saying is we don't have anywhere in the, new, in the Bible where it says those were regular 24-hour days. I remember I was preaching at the uh, Christian Church of Holiday, and I came up with what I thought was going to be a great idea. I was going to illustrate, because one of the things that Jesus does and Paul, he puts man at the beginning. Man was there at the beginning. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 1? Since the beginning of creation, his individual attributes are clearly seen. His power and attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Well, dog, well, maybe I shouldn't use a dog because some of you have dogs, and I have a cat. So let's go with a cow. A cow has no idea. Well, some of you might have pet cows. <laughs> well, pick an animal you don't have. A giraffe. A, gi a giraffe has no idea about creation. Who is understanding what was made? Man. And both Paul and Jesus put man at the beginning. So I came up with this idea. I measured across our auditorium. And I called that however many millions of years it was. And man's only been here about 500,000. And I was going to 
go over to the side of the thing, and I was going to measure out, you know, two feet, and I was going to stand there, and I was going to say, here's where man showed up. There's where creation was. Do I look like I'm at the beginning? Well, when I did the math, man's been here about a quarter inch. And I was all bummed out. And I said, man, my great illustration was ruined. And then I realized it wasn't ruined after all. So I got there on Sunday and I went over there and I smashed my head against the wall. And, and you did that. I said, is it like I'm at the beginning? You know? And the answer was no. So That was fun. <laughs> all right, we got time for one more. And my voice is hanging in there. We'll do number seven and then we'll be done. That although doctrinal exhibitions of the great system of divine truths and defensive testimonies in opposition to prevailing errors be highly expedient, and the more full and explicit they be for those purposes, the better. Yet, as these must be in a great measure the effect of human reasoning, and of course must contain many inferential truths, they ought not to be made terms of Christian communion, unless we suppose what is contrary to fact, that none have a right to the communion of the church, but such as possess a very clear and decisive judgment, or are come to a very high degree of doctrinal information, whereas the church from the beginning did and ever will consist of little children and young men as well as fathers. Thank you very much. You did a good job. What Campbell's saying is creeds, we don't use that word much, but defenses of the faith, they're expedient for the work of the church. And they'll contain, possibly, some inferred truths, but they ought not be a test of fellowship. Don't formulate a creed and make it binding. The statements can be helpful, but don't make them binding on people. It's kind of, this is really very much a follow-up from what we just, what he just talked about. He basically said, don't make your understanding of the scriptures test of fellowship. Then he turns around and says, but it is okay to write those down because that, can, that might be expedient. Because someone's going to come in here and say, what do you guys think about Lord's Supper? Well, we think the Bible teaches, do it every week. What do you think about baptism? Well, baptism is by immersion for the forgiveness of sin. And what he is saying is it's good to write those down. They're expedient. And the more full and explicit, the better. But don't make those things a test of fellowship. And, you know, top of the next page, Campbell wants the Christians to mature in knowledge, but fellowship and communion shouldn't be based on what he called the very clear and decisive judgment or a very high degree of doctrinal information. I think this one's real straightforward. And we talked about Colossians chapter 2 last night. I won't repeat it. But, you know, statements of faith, because people do... What I do, anytime I, I get invited to preach somewhere, I will always go out and read the congregation's statement of faith. And if, if you put on your, you know, if I drag down to your website and it says, I drag down to what we believe, and it takes me to a page, and there I read, see the New Testament. Well, that doesn't help me. That doesn't help me. You know? But I go out to the one here, and I read down there and I, I scrolled down through it and I, yours is really good. I liked it because it was, it had information in it. It didn't skirt issues. It was just plain. But you get down there and it's like you have to believe in God. You have to believe in Christ and his work. And you have to have faith in him and confess and repent and be baptized in water. I thought, well, that's good. I like that. And then finally down there it says that Jesus is going to physically I think literally it's something like that, come back for his bride. Well, that's what the New Testament teaches. Now, you can read through there and get a real good handle on what the congregation believes. I like them. But when they come in here, you don't hand that to them and say, sign that and agree. You don't make that thing a test of fellowship. Those are the things that the New Testament, everything that was on your sheet, the New Testament teaches. You get someone in here from a different background or a no background, over time they're going to come to understand all that. But why are they going to understand it? Because it's what New Testament teaches. And Thomas Campbell's saying, produce these things, but don't make those things test of fellowship. What can we make a test of fellowship? 
not in that form. Well, maybe you do. That's right. Now, yeah, yeah. I think. Right. Yeah, I think what he's. Yeah, I agree with you because you're right. The things that are on your your statement of faith is a definitive thing about who's in Christ and who's not in Christ. I think what I'm thinking is, what he's saying is, when he makes the comment that the church necessarily will have little children and young men as well as fathers, what Thomas Campbell means by that is you're going to have new Christians. And new Christians may not understand some of these things. And this ties into the one before it. These two go together, six and seven go together very much. What he says in number six is, you, um, what he said in number six is, don't make your interpretations test of fellowship, which you might understand about certain things. Now, w- but what he says in number seven is, it's good to write them down because it helps people understand where you're coming from. But don't make it a test of fellowship from a standpoint of a person has to accept those things before they're ready to accept them. Does that make sense? I can tell by looking at your face, it doesn't make sense. Well, but what's know, interesting about your test... Because what, he was coming out of a different background than, than a lot right, of today. Right, right. And I understand his aversion. He had an aversion to preaching and teaching and all that kind of stuff. Right. And he was coming out of a different background. Right. Your statement, you might be thinking about your statement specifically. Yours, I read through it. It's as biblical as... It's one of the most biblical ones I've seen. Some of them are really good because your statements are short and succinct and very straightforward. And basically, you're just restating scriptures. You didn't have any Bible references on there, which is fine. But they're just, yours are very straightforward. But I've seen others that they've got things in there that are not, there's more things that you would be taught than are plainly taught. Does that make sense? So I think it depends on this proposition that he has here it kind of it's generic and it's not easy to just to blanket apply to everybody because different statements have different levels you know I don't I don't know if I'm, I feel like I'm mumbling but I don't mean to be but yours the one that you guys have here is very good the one where we attend the Spring Hill Church of Christ is very good it's just basically restatement of Bible things and that becomes a test of fellowship and the fact that they're, but they're very, I can't think of anything in your statement that really talks about how it's a something that you've studied out and put upon people. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Because you're careful not to do that. Right. And, and more people should be. Yeah. But I read things that aren't. You know, I read things that aren't. So. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. 
We, I think we were talking about this yesterday. You weren't with us. I was talking with somebody. I think Corey and I were talking about this, or Jeff and I were. This morning. This morning we were talking about that this morning. We, I, when I was preaching at Union Grove Christian Church, we did the same exact thing. And I went to a similar, uh, where some legal, guys, two lawyers came in and talked to us. We did some very similar things. But that's kind of a little bit different than what this is, but it's still all related to this is what we believe and we've got it written down. And we're going to stay within those bounds. I was thinking, yeah, and I think that's part of it. I was trying to think about your statement of faith. If there was any way to apply it to this, this may be a stretch. I was just trying to make it exactly applied at the Christ Mission Church. But there's a, one of the statements in there that says something about Christ's blood. Somewhere in there, I think there's a statement about Christ's blood. And this might be a stretch. I'm, like I said, I'm trying to apply it. But somebody's a relatively new of tender and they come forward and they want to be baptized into Christ and they understand they understand Christ died for them and they understand that they have to repent and they got to obey the gospel be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of sins well they may not know yet how the blood works in that they may not have any concept of the Old Testament sacrifice where Paul talks about the, his blood being a propitiation they may not understand that yet. And my point is you wouldn't say, okay, we baptize you into Christ, but you're not a, we're not gonna, you're a, we're not gonna make the fact that we talk about blood a test of fellowship. We will let you come along in your understanding of that as long as you have obeyed the gospel of Christ. Corey. I think what I, I'm just meaning, using it as a phrase of who we consider to be a brother in Christ. Who do we consider to be a fellow Christian, a fellow brother or sister in Christ? That's the way I use the phrase. And that's the way Thomas Campbell used the phrase. When he says test of fellowship, now Jeff is right. They were coming out of this background with who was allowed to take communion, who was not allowed to take communion. They had all kinds of crazy rules about that. I'm just using it as a, the way he did, which was who do I consider to be a brother in Christ? They, that... Um, and you guys yesterday, what day is today, Monday? Yeah, yesterday about you encourage baptized believers to participate in communion. And I agree with that. You know, that's who the, the Lord suffers for the church. And um, that's part of what their whole arguments were about. Who was allowed to participate in communion and who wasn't. And we're not going, well, so when I say test of fellowship, it's who do I consider to be a brother in Christ? What are the requirements to, for me to consider somebody to be a brother in Christ. And what I like about your guys' website is everything in there, like Jeff said, everything in there is a dividing line. You don't have anything in there that um, I would consider to be something that is a, something you understand from the scriptures that you're imposing upon people. I don't know if they would have run them out or not. I don't know.
Well, well, I'm not really sure what it looked like practically back then because I wasn't there and I haven't read much about that. Um, but they definitely had a lot of people in their groups that were coming from all kinds of backgrounds. And I'm sure they had a lot of people every Sunday that had different thoughts about things. And for your example, yeah, you want people. You guys are preaching the truth. You believe in the truth. You have the truth. You want people to come. And you want them to keep coming so they can keep learning. And, and on a practical standpoint, you're passing communion. Maybe they're not baptized into Christ, but if they take communion, you probably don't, they probably don't bother you. You just, you would prefer it be for people who've been baptized into Christ, but when it goes by, you're not going to have the usher tell them, oh, no, you can't take that, you know. And you want them to come along. But the question becomes when, and you, it may not even be something that you vocally say, but at what point do you acknowledge them as being a brother in Christ? And that is what I mean by test of fellowship. Until a person's baptized into Christ, they're not there because they're not in Christ. And our brotherhood is in Christ. And, so, you know, the things that are in your scripture about God creating and him being sovereign and Jesus being God, those things being, you have on things about being born of Mary. Those things are test of fellowship because those are plain Bible teachings that are critical to the Christian faith. You know, Jesus being virgin conceived is an essential Christian doctrine. And him being, you guys, you have something on there about him being resurrected. That's an essential Christian doctrine. And until someone accepts those, I can't accept them as a brother in Christ. And there are groups out there that deny those things. They deny bodily resurrection. They deny that Jesus was God. They deny the scriptures are inspired. Those things are, they're just unbiblical. And something that's against the plain Bible teaching, I can't consider that person to be a brother in Christ. And if they're coming here on Sunday morning, I want to keep teaching them. I want to keep teaching them. And I hope, if I know they have those views, I want them to keep coming. Then you walk forward one day, then we'll join the church, and you're going to tell them, hey, we'll talk afterwards. And you'll tell everybody, hey, Leroy came forward today. He wants to be part of us. We're going to talk to him in more detail about that. Everybody have a good lunch. You know, I assume that's what you do. Yeah. Well, let me give you an example. When you went back to Genesis chapter 1, years ago, before most of these people here, Henry was here, we had a couple come in. He was a lieutenant in the Army. He was a conservation officer in the Reserve. He, on his own route, he was a, born in 1870. And he became Dutchman. Yeah, see, that's a real good example. Yeah. And you have a question. Oh, okay. Good for you. I saw you up there in the front row. Yes, ma'am. That's right. Yep, and what we're going to start with, the very next proposition tomorrow night is just the basics a person has to understand to become a Christian. And there's going to be other things that are going to come along like you were just talking about. That guy understood he needed to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of his sins. There's other things he needed to know. We'll get to those later. Over time. That's it for the night. That was a lively... Session. Sure. I mean, I'll stay here as long as you guys want to. Going back to Proverbs 56, about when you read the scriptures, I'm sure you use the example there in Corinthians where the body, what the body means. You know, and one person might believe it's the body of Jesus Christ, one person might believe it's the, the body is in the church. And if you believe one and I believe another way, I absolutely agree with you. We don't make that test of fellowship. But one of us is wrong. Correct.
Correct. Or both of us are wrong. Right. Oh, I totally agree with that. Yeah. One was, or both need to be. And the reason I say it is because I think sometimes we get sloppy the other way. And we want to excuse ourselves or the other person by saying, well, it, it probably means both. That's not a right answer. Yeah, and I'm kind of glad you brought that up. That, I probably should have made that clear. Did everybody hear what Jeff said? You talking about that, where are the dead? One of us thinks they're in heaven, one of us thinks they're in paradise. One of us is wrong, or both of us are wrong. We both are not right. And we're, me and my friend are trying to sort that out, figure out which one's wrong. Right, but yes, we're studying over it. And we, still one another, but you're studying it out. Yeah, and we can get sloppy. We just decide, well, I got my position, you got yours, we give up. No, we ought to keep trying to study on these things and keep trying to figure it out. Yeah, because it's very important to realize that we're not both right. Yeah, you got another question. That's right. You know, the scriptures have one right understanding. Every scripture has one right understanding. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure that out. And if you understand it one way, and I understand it another way, one of us is wrong. Or both of us are wrong. And maybe there's a third option. And what we need to do is, I need every once in a while to say, can you explain to me again why you hold that position? And I may he hear something, and everybody here knows what it's like when the ninth time you hear something, it's like, oh, yeah, now I got it. You know? Sometimes it takes a while, but we should, on the things we know we disagree on, we should keep trying. But as we're talking about things that are, for lack of a better term, they don't involve a person becoming in Christ, believing in him, you know, God being the creator, Jesus being the savior, repentance, baptism into Christ, those fundamental things. We're talking about understanding other scriptures that we're trying to understand properly. Somebody else had a question. Would you say then that, uh, I mean, you get the interpretation of it because mine is mine, or you can say the exact truth. So is that like a, an agree to disagree for the time being? Because until we're, until we're enlightened by Christ, that this is what is exactly what it means. I mean, or are we just going to kind of like dis agree to disagree? Well, you're kind of to agree to disagree for now. But you should, keep, but you, but like Jeff and I were talking about, we should continue to try to figure out which one of those understandings is right. And actually, some of the things that I mean, I've changed my mind on things. I remember teaching a Bible school series on things I changed my mind on, and and, it, and I did that for like two months, and I think the guys were getting a little nervous. But you know, but but there are things you change your mind on. But one of the reasons why you change your mind on is you think you understand something. Then you'll hear a guy preach something, you know, your friend will make a comment, and you'll, maybe you'll think, well, I never thought about that. I never understood it that way. And then hopefully you'll continue to work on it. And but what Jeff's saying is, I got one understanding, you have another. On one of these passages, it's not clear. We shouldn't just give it up for life. We should continue to try to engage one another, see if we can figure out which one of us is wrong. Yeah. But in the short term, yeah, and the short term may become years, but yeah, for the short term, but agree to disagree, but not to the point where you never cycle back and try it again. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, see, that's another one of the arguments right out of the passage itself. Because if they were, you know, the, he uses those phrases, and if it was eons of time, then what do those words mean? Yeah. We understand a season. We understand a year. We understand a day. But if what's going on in there is eons of time, then, then those, what was the sun marking during those periods? Yeah. I, I think that's a plain passage, but yeah. Well, that was fun tonight, I think.
Oh, I hope tomorrow I have more voice. Well, let's, it's poor outside, isn't it? Are you, got another question? All right, well, let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this day, and we thank you for the time tonight. We pray that it's been profitable for all of us. If nothing else, it's got our minds thinking about the things of God and the things of your word. Lord, we pray that you'll take us home safe. Just give us a good day tomorrow, and we look forward to being back tomorrow night. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.